All right. So my name is Molly Burgoyne, and I'm going to be talking to you all today about my research experiment that I've been working on for the past two years that investigates the cultural context of learning. So I'm interested in learning more about how the environment of a classroom can help to promote learning and foster a really positive environment for students. Specifically, I'm interested in looking at the physiological mechanisms that allow therapy balls to improve focus in a classroom setting. So in order to explain to you all how therapy balls work, it's important to understand sensory processing. So this image helps to visualize how sensory processing works. First, a sensory stimulus will come into, for example, the vestibular system, which consists of the inner ear and provides information um, to the brain about the position of the head in space. So this vestibular system helps a lot with balance and posture. So if, for example, I get pushed backwards and my head moves back, my vestibular system will get a stimulus telling my brain stem to organize that information, send it to the thalamus, which is labeled as number three. I wish I had a pointer. Um, which is the um, processing center for the brain. So once it is organized and sent to the thalamus, that stimulus is then sent to the cerebellum, which helps to, um, it, that helps with balance and posture, and it also helps to organize all of that sensory information and produce a coordinated response to the particular environment. So in the case of my head moving backwards, my cerebellum would communicate with my um, abdominal and lower back muscles to contract and to return me to my regular standing position. So sensory processing is happening all the time. It happens rapidly and it's involved in any kind of process from riding a bike to reading a book. The success of that process is dependent on your sensory processing system. So with sensory processing disorders, that happens when there's kind of a traffic jam in the processing part of this diagram. So these people can get sensory input, but they can't quite process it properly to produce an appropriate response. So this creates a lot of challenges in performing daily tasks and can lead to things like behavioral problems and poor school performance. But it can be treated using heightened sensory tools, which is what I'm most interested in. So these are a few examples of heightened sensory tools, uh, therapy balls, rocking chairs, and a seated therapy cushion. So these tools provide extra sensory input. If we look back at this diagram, they bombard the sensory input and kind of make sure that the individual can pick out the relevant stimuli. So by bombarding the sensory input system, they're better able to pick out what's relevant in a room. So in a classroom setting, this is helpful because then the student can focus on the task at hand and perform better in the classroom. So why therapy balls? The research that I've looked at is mostly observational. Um, it states that students and teachers prefer using therapy balls in a classroom. Um, it helps to improve their focus. It helps to improve their learning and it has a positive effect on in-seat behavior, which means for the teachers that they're better able to teach in a, an effective manner. So my study, I want to examine why this is happening. Why, why is there an improvement in focus in the classroom? Because all of these studies are very observational, and I wanted to see physiologically what is going on to make this happen. So the first step to doing that was to conduct an observational study, which was recently accepted for a publication in the Journal of Education and Training Studies. And for this study, I worked in a second grade classroom with 19 students at Hillsborough Elementary School. We had three different observation sessions with three independent observers. The first observation was conducted when students were on standard chairs and the next two were when therapy balls were implemented into the classroom. So we were able to see a before and after effect of 
therapy ball intervention. So we observed a variety of behaviors for our observational study, but the behaviors that we were most interested in were on and off task behavior and what kinds of things the students were doing on the ball. So for the first observation, students were on a chair and we observed mostly stationary behavior. There was not a lot of rocking and bouncing involved in stationary chair seating, which was expected. Then when we went into the classroom and looked at students while they were sitting on a therapy ball, we saw a lot higher frequencies of bouncing and rocking behavior. And we saw some stationary and other behavior, and the other behavior was categorized as kneeling, W-sit, leaning, walking, standing, and shaking of limbs. So there were a lot of other behaviors going on that we wanted to look more into. When we compared the first and second observations, we saw a significant difference in on-task behavior. Without therapy balls, there's about a 50-50 um, frequency of on and off task behaviors. But with the use of therapy balls, there's an 85% frequency of on task observed behavior and a 15% frequency of off task behavior, which we found really interesting. And we wanted to look a little bit more into that and see what kinds of behaviors were leading to this significant difference. So in the third observation, we looked at the students on therapy balls again, and we wanted to learn more about the behaviors that they were performing. So we were more specific about our coding and our um, variables that we were looking at in this observation. And again, we saw increased bouncing and rocking behavior on the therapy ball as we did in the, in the second observation. But this time, we focused on the other behaviors and saw that they were mostly W-sit, leaning, kneeling, and shaking. Um, and for those of you who don't know, W-sit position looks kind of like this. The legs are in a W letter shape on the ball. So when we looked at the on and off task behaviors, it followed the same trend as before. We saw a lot higher frequency of on task behavior on the therapy ball um, and very minimal off task behavior. And it's noteworthy that on our third observation, it was about two months after the first two observations, and students over time um, adapted their behavior. So at the beginning um, of our observations, students would have really vigorous bouncing or really intense rocking behaviors. But as time went on, they modified that behavior, and it became more subtle so that they were kind of able to figure out what they needed on the therapy ball and how much feedback they needed from that, which was really interesting. So what we concluded from our observational study was that on-task behavior increases with therapy ball use. But we also saw that the behavior that students performed on these therapy balls could be categorized into proprioceptive and vestibular behavior. So I talked a little bit about vestibular um, processing before and how that comes from the inner ear and provides information about the location of the head in space. So those behaviors would be things like rocking and bouncing on the therapy ball. Proprioceptive input is received by the brain and gives it information about the location of the limbs in space and the force and velocity required for certain movements. So those kinds of behaviors would include things like leaning, kneeling, W-sit. So those were the two categories that we saw most frequently. And our hypothesis then was that by bombarding the sensory system with increased input, the sensory processing can be improved to focus on the relevant stimuli. So we wanted to test this hypothesis by developing an experiment which investigated how proprioceptive and vestibular input would affect the performance in the classroom. So for my experimental study, I had 20 participants between second and fifth grade, and they came in and initially performed a Biodex balance test, which gave us information about their sway um, under different conditions. And after that test, they performed functional school skills, which included a, math, a timed math test, a reading assessment, a pegboard test to assess fine motor skills and a King Devic test to assess focus. 
and they repeated these tests for each of four conditions, and those conditions were on a therapy ball with no instruction, on a therapy ball with instruction to perform a W-sit position, which was proprioceptive, and then uh, on a therapy ball, rocking or bouncing, which was the vestibular category, and on a standard chair as a control. So after those tests were performed under each of the conditions, the participant again took the balance test and we measured sway to compare to our initial assessment of balance. So these are just some pictures of testing. Um, there, that's the Biodex balance system and that's how we measured sway before and after. And part, the other picture is a participant performing a functional school task on a therapy ball. And during the testing, we had an accelerometer placed on all participants' backs, which gave us information about the acceleration in the X, Y, and Z axes. And so this acceleration data showed us that participants were performing the uh, conditions as we asked them to. So. Um, Basically, it told us that our experimental um, conditions were working. Then when we looked at sway before and after the intervention, we saw that the sway was actually increasing after the therapy ball intervention. So this means that when students were on therapy balls, they were receiving more sensory information. So then when they went to perform the balance test after this intervention, they were trying to incorporate more sensory information to try to balance. So basically, there's a kind of learning curve for these participants who, within this age group, their sensory system isn't quite fully developed, which means that when they're exposed to this extra sensory information, they aren't accustomed to that and therefore have to learn how to start pulling that information in and integrating that to perform the task at hand, and in this case, that was balance. So overall, the increase in sway shows us that we were engaging the sensory system by using therapy balls. So after I analyzed the results as a whole, I wanted to look specifically at certain groups. Um, I wanted to compare gymnasts who are very used to vestibular activity. They're trained to use their vestibular system often to a group of participants with sensory integration disorders. And as you can see from these graphs, the gymnasts do not show increased sway after the therapy ball intervention, which we kind of expected because they're used to using their vestibular system and when we look at the sensory integration disorder participants, their sway increases after the intervention, which tells us that these students are trying to learn how to incorporate more sensory information and therefore have a little bit more sway after they're exposed to that extra sensory input. So what we can say from the comparison between these two groups is that over time, perhaps, with practice, and exposure to extrasensory information, sensory integration can improve for these individuals and therefore they can be better able to respond to the environment around them. So to summarize my findings from my experiment, there were no decrements in performance due to therapy ball use. So across all four conditions, there, were, there was no change in the performance on any of the functional school tasks. However, with the therapy ball, there were more opportunities to engage in vestibular and proprioceptive strategies. So the therapy balls allow students to engage their sensory system, and the continued use of the therapy balls can lead to sensory integration improvements. So to take the next step, I explained how my observational study led to my experimental study, but after I completed that study, I wanted to learn a little bit more about what was going on in the brain. So currently I'm working on a study to examine how increasing sensory input can improve attention. Um, and to do that I'm using EEG, which measures the activity in the brain. And as this image shows, there's a link between 
sensory integration and learning. So I want to investigate how sensory, extra sensory input can influence attention in a classroom setting and I'll be analyzing um, and conducting this experiment for the next month. <laughs> it's underway currently. <laughs> so how does this apply? From my research, I learned how important the environment is to learning and how a very, a relatively easy modality to implement in the classroom can have a huge impact on the way that students learn and on how students feel about learning. So understanding why these tools work is really important so that teachers can understand how to effectively instruct in their classrooms and so that students can enjoy learning. Um, and a more educated youth is important because that makes a more educated adult who can then go on to do really great things and make discoveries. 